good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Ashish Lal. Uh, I am a tenure track investigator in the genetics branch of uh, NCI. And uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Judy Lieberman, uh, who is a professor at Harvard Medical School. And uh, I was a postdoc uh, in Judy's lab before I started my lab at NCI. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to introduce Judy today for, the, uh, for this week's uh, Walls Lecture, which is uh, also the George Curry Memorial Lecture for 2018. Um, so uh, Dr. George uh, Curry was an uh, outstanding scientist. Um, he was a, a cancer virologist and uh, a former chief of the Laboratory of Molecular Virology at NCI. Uh, he graduated from Princeton and Harvard Medical Schools. And after that, he became the head of the virus tumor biology section at the Laboratory of Molecular Virology at NCI. He was the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the Arthur Fleming Award for Outstanding Government Service. Uh, he was the uh, elected member of the National Academy of Sciences at a very young age. Um, his research was focused on the mechanisms of uh, eukaryotic uh, transcription regulation. Uh, he published more than 140 papers and uh, he was one of the first to demonstrate an important role of enhancers in the regulation of gene expression. Uh, many of his trainees and collaborators, you can see here, are uh, big names and uh, you know, leaders in their field, and uh, many of them are uh, members of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, the George Cowrie uh, Lecture started in 1995 uh, with uh, the Nobel laureate uh, Philip Sharp, who is a professor at MIT, as the first speaker, followed by many other distinguished speakers, uh, some of them being uh, members of the National Academy of Science and some of them being Nobel laureates. Uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Judy Lieberman, is also a very accomplished and outstanding uh, scientist. Uh, she is a professor at the Department of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and chair in cellular and molecular medicine at uh, Boston's University Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, she obtained her undergrad, um, summa cum laude. I, I, I was looking at what this means, and I found that it means the highest honor. Uh, so she graduated from, uh, so she did her undergrad from Harvard University. Uh, she earned her PhD uh, in theoretical physics uh, from Rockefeller University and then went to med school uh, at Harvard. After uh, a short postdoc uh, at MIT, she was recruited to Tufts as uh, assistant professor. Uh, she then moved to uh, Harvard as an assistant professor, and in 2004, uh, she became full professor at the Department of Pedi uh, Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Uh, since 2012, she's the professor and chair of the Cellular and Molecular Medicine, Boston Children's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School. Uh, Judy's research is very, very diverse. She, uh, you can see here, so she, uh, her research is very diverse, and she is a, a leading researcher in many fields, including uh, the molecular basis of cytotoxicity by killer cells, RNAi therapeutics, non-coding RNAs, and cancer. Uh, she is the recipient of many awards and honors, including the Clinical Investigator Award, uh, Hope is a Vaccine Award. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she is the recipient of the Outstanding Physician Scientist Award. And one award that is that is not shown here is, is I would say, related to her her mentoring. And I can say that because I did my postdoc in her lab, and I would say that you know, she is an outstanding mentor who really cares a lot for the graduate student and, and postdocs, not only in terms of you know, getting papers out, but she, she helps them move to the, to the next stage of their career, and she really cares for that. 
and, 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 and I'm very grateful and, and, and thankful to Judy for that. So with this, uh, here is the title, uh, a shorter version of the title of, uh, of our uh, talk title today, is Sounding the Alarm and Putting Out the Fire. Uh, please join me in welcoming Judy Lieberman. Thank you, uh, Ashish. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I know when Dr. Corey did his work, the idea of uh, tumor viruses was very uh, cutting edge, not universally accepted, and now it's just part of the way we think of, of cancer. Um, I'm also honored to be at the NIH to give this talk, which is going to be about the molecular basis of inflammation because um, my first faculty job, I was hired by Shelley Wolf, um, who actually, and people at the NIH actually, in a lot of ways, started research in inflammation, studying some of the genetic inflammatory diseases and the roots for cloning uh, IL-1, one of the most important uh, mediators of inflammation are here. Uh, in, at the N N NIH. Um, my talk today is going to be about um, some work we've done over the last couple of years, um, figuring out uh, how uh, the molecular basis for inflammation, and uh, basically inflammation uh, is now implicated in uh, almost every disease. I think uh, the, our understanding of the molecular basis uh, perhaps will lead to new ways of preventing uh, inflammation. So this is, uh, we're going to get to this uh, um, later, but this is the structure of the pore that's responsible for inflammatory cell death and the paper uh, describing this was just published this month in Nature. So it, it involves a protein called gastermin D, which probably very few of you have heard about. Um, and I think you're going to hear a lot more about it um, soon. So um, the immune system has a challenge. Um, Namely, how does it uh, distinguish the uh, microbes that live within us, which out outnumber our cells enormously, from the beneficial ones, the commensals, from the microbes that are dangerous, invading our cells and, and causing damage? Um, and this sort of balance has to exist in the skin and all the mucosal surfaces of the body, that we have to be able to distinguish what's harmful from what is uh, beneficial and harmless. And the immune system basically has um, two uh, types of responses. It has an immediate response. Um, which is called innate immunity that occurs uh, within hours and recognizes common features on uh, infectious organism. Um, and, and that sort of primes the system, recruits uh, uh, immune cells to the site of, of infection, and then later, oh, about a week later, actually specific immune cells that recognize the pathogen um, and develop a long-term memory response um, are recruited. So what happens here early really determines what's, how, we're, how we respond to infection. And many of those cells are uh, myeloid cells, uh, dendritic cells, uh, neutrophils, um, and also some lymphocytes, natural killer cells. And then there are some 
uh, lymphocytes that sort of span, they're what I call innate-like lymphocytes that also respond to common features in infection, um, like natural killer T cells and gamma delta T cells. And uh, only later do you get antibodies and specific T cell responses. Um, for a lot of, uh, this is really a new field. Um, basically, um, most immunologists who study innate Im immunity have really focused on immune uh, antigen presenting cells like macrophages and dendritic cells. But it's clear that the mucosal surfaces of the body, the skin, and the linings of uh, the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract, ha are also very important because that's where most uh, of where we encounter most infections. But the immunity that occurs at these surfaces is only really very recently uh, be being explored. So uh, I've basically divided my talk into um, sounding the alarm, how the immune system uh, responds or recognizes invasive infection, and then into uh, how it begins to, to respond to the, how it responds to it. And basically, the immune system recognizes uh, strangers, uh, uh, common features of microbes or pathogen-associated molecular patterns called PAMPs, or signals that a cell has been uh, damaged or invaded, and those are called uh, DAMPs or danger-associated molecular patterns, and those come from the host. So the PAMPs and DAMPs can be any of a variety of molecules. They can be metabolites, sugars, lipids, crystals, nucleic acids, or proteins. And they are either a common feature of a class of microbes, like uh, a lipid uh, that's on the membrane of a lot of bacteria, like LPS, or they could be a sign that the host cell is under attack. They're either molecules that are only made during infection, um, or they can be our own molecules, but that are localized in the wrong place. For example, DNA in the cytoplasm, or a ATP outside of cells. Um, and sometimes, uh, the same pattern recognition receptor uh, can recognize both PAMPs and DAMPs. And for the really sort of uh, important uh, patterns of microbes, such as lipopolysaccharide or LPS on gram-negative bacteria, they're actually recognized by multiple um, innate immune sensors. So, as to just to sort of set the stage and illustrate how young this field is, the first mammalian uh, pattern recognition receptor was identified by Charles Janeway and uh, Ruslan Medsedov only 20 years ago. Uh, and it was based on homology of uh, um, mammalian toll-like receptors and IL-1 receptor to uh, uh, Drosophila toll. The toll-like receptors exist on the extracellular, uh, in the, on the uh, outer membrane of our cells or in endosomes, basically uh, topological spaces that are contiguous with the outside. And they recognize a variety of uh, microbial PAMPs. Um, from all kinds of organisms, uh, bacteria, fungi, uh, uh, parasites. And 
but they can, they're, they're sort of sensors of infection on the outside and they cannot distinguish commensals from invasive uh, microbes. And basically when those receptors get uh, sense uh, infection, uh, mostly uh, on the outside or in the compartment that's contiguous with the outside, the endosome, what they do is prime the immune response. They turn on the expression of, of the sensors, adapters, and effector, effector molecules of inflammation. And they do that mostly by activating NF-kappa B and interferon uh, response factors that regulate transcription. And again, this doesn't distinguish invasion from uh, harmless bacteria. It just sets the tune. So you have the toll-like receptors on the outside. You also have a number of lectin receptors, the C-type le lectin receptors, of which there are uh, many on the outside. And they detect uh, outside infection inside the cell, which is what would distinguish something that's invasive or dangerous from a commensal. You have a, a fa families of receptors, um, of which there are about 25 or so, um, that recognize uh, RNA, the rig like receptors, DNA in the cytosol, um, the AIM2-like receptors, and a family of about 22 uh, in humans receptors that recognize all kinds of different uh, PAMPs, including bacterial, uh, flagella, uh, uh, components of the type 3 secretion system, crystals in cells, ATP, uh, toxin, the effects of bacterial toxins. And uh, basically, these are the sensors that really are the alarms of danger, of invasive infection or cytosolic uh, damage. And they activate uh, inflammation by activating the formation of a large complex called the inflammasome. And as I said, there are many ways to activate uh, this process. Uh, the one that's been most studied is called the canonical inflammasome, which recognizes different uh, bacterial or other infectious uh, uh, um, nucleic acids to, or to form uh, large uh, uh, amyloid-like complexes inside cells that recruit uh, a, 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 a cas pro-inflammatory caspase 1 precursor that gets activated by, the, by proximity in this complex uh, into a protease that, has, uh, that is uh, sort of key to activating inflammation. And the, the canonical, these um, inflammasomes work on a simple principle. You have a sensor, um, uh, usually that senses through these leucine-rich repeats, either PAMPs from different microorganisms or DAMPs. And those DAMPs include things like cholesterol crystals that uh, relate to atherosclerosis, amyloid particles that relate to amyloid disease, uric acid crystals for gout. And ba so basically, this inflammatory pathway is implicated in many diseases. And when the sensor uh, senses um, one of these danger signals or infection signals, uh, it recruits um, it, it's this domain uh, recruits an adapter, uh, and one of the main adapters is called ASK, uh, which then uh, assembles here to recruit by these homotypic uh, interaction domains the 
CAS space precursor, and the CAS spaces get activated and cleave each other. Once the uh, inflammatory CAS space one is activated, it cleaves pro interleukins into IL-1 beta and IL-18, and uh, the activated CAS space induces pyroptosis, which is this inflammatory cell death. A couple of years ago, another kind of inflammatory uh, complex was identified called the non-canonical inflammasome. And it's a much simpler system than I described for the canonical inflammasome. It's activated by LPS, either in, from bacteria that are invading into the cytosol or in uh, vesicles that are coated with LPS that are released by gram-negative bacteria. And uh, LPS binds to a, a set of inflammatory caspases, caspase 4 and 5 in humans and 11 in mice, causes them to form a large complex, an oligomer, which activates these inflammatory caspases. Um, so, uh, this, this uh, inflammasome recognizes LPS, it probably uh, recognizes other kinds of lipids, uh, perhaps from other microorganism or oxidized uh, lipids that are produced during cellular stress. So, so basically, inflammation is composed of two main events. One is this fiery death, pyroptosis, in which the cell membrane gets permeabilized and cells release the inflammatory caspases that have been processed by the caspases and also release a number of other small molecule mediators. Um, it's not clear exactly what they are. They're not, they haven't been well defined. The other main event is the processing of the inflammatory cytokines into active uh, cytokines, and their release is, requires uh, this, these, uh, this pyroptotic death. So these events, uh, the inflammatory cytokines and some of the factors released during inflammation, recruit immune cells uh, to the site of infection um, and help control infection. But if the infection isn't controlled, this inflammatory response becomes extremely dangerous and can lead to multi-organ failure and sepsis. So, um, Two, two, two years ago, two and a half years ago, two papers uh, identified the mediator for pyroptosis, for this inflammatory fiery death, as a protein called gastermin D. So when either the non-canonical inflammasome was activated or the canonical inflammasome was activated, um, the inflammatory caspases cleave gastermin D, which is made up of two domains, an N-terminal and C-terminal domain, and the N-terminal domain is responsible for fiery death. The canonical inflammasome also activates the pro-inflammatory cytokines, but the uh, non-canonical pathway doesn't activate uh, it only indirectly by when the cells are damaged, the uh, caspase one is activated. And in fact, uh, so far, the only um, known substrate for caspase 11 or caspase 4 and 5 in humans is this molecule gastermin D, which when, when, um, when we started working on this, when this paper came out, there were only a, less than a handful of papers about gastermin D. For, the, for now, 
All you have to know is that the gastermins are, as their name implies, they're proteins that are in the gastrointestinal tract, on the skin, and in the mu mucosal cells, as well as in immune uh, inflammatory cells. So this, uh, not the, the canonical inflammasome is mostly uh, active in uh, immune cells, macrophages and dendritic cells. It has to be primed um, by uh, toll-like receptors and uh, or other signals of outside infection. But the non-canonical inflammasome, at least in humans, caspase-4, is constitutively expressed, and it's expressed at the mucosal surfaces as well as the immune cells. And uh, I've, I'm coming to the conclusion that this new non-canonical inflammasome may actually be more important in inflammation than what all the immunologists have been studying for the last decade. Um, oops. So, we got, this is a field I only got into uh, recently, uh, two years ago, and we wanted to understand how does uh, cleavage of gastermin the lead to inflammation. I, this, is, this is a very important question, um, and I, I'm a doctor. I didn't realize how important it was until I started reading some of the statistics. And basically, uh, sepsis, which is caused when inflammation gets out of control uh, in infection, is one of the leading killers in the world. It actually kills the most children uh, in the world, and one in, in, one in every uh, adult hospital death, sepsis plays a role. So um, there have been, basically it's only treated by trying to control the infection with antibiotics and supportive care as the vascular um, system uh, leaks, the blood supply becomes limiting, organ, all the main organs of the body fail and uh, people go into shock. There have been hundreds of clinical trials trying to intervene to do something to treat sepsis. They have all failed. And basically, the drug industry has given up on trying to figure out ways of treating sepsis. And I think they've failed, perhaps, or hopefully, because we didn't really understand the mechanism behind sepsis and how, how because. Basically, all those different sensors and inflammasome, there are many things get, that can trigger sepsis, and it's hard to block any of them. And what I'm going to try to argue is that the final common pathway is pyroptosis and cleavage of gastermin D, and perhaps that will provide a new way of, of treating sepsis. So, but I, this is just a figure to illustrate how important this alternate inflammasome, the uh, here caspase 11 in mice and gastermin D is in the process of sepsis. So if you inject LPS into mice uh, at enough dose, they will all die very rapidly from sepsis. But mice that are deficient in the uh, non-canonical inflammasome, caspase 11, or in gastermin D, mostly survive. And if you did the same experiment by knocking out the canonical uh, caspase, caspase 1, it would have very little effect on, on whether cells, on whether mice live and die. So I think that suggests that this is worth looking at. Just so um, I'm finishing up my long uh, background, I, but, uh, but since you probably don't know very much about the gastermins, and in fact, nobody knows very much about them, I just wanted to show you 
um, the family in mice and humans. Humans have four uh, gas thermins, A, B, C, and D. Uh, they're localized, A in the skin, uh, C in the gastrointestinal tract, B in the lungs mostly, D in the skin and um, gastrointestinal tract. And then there are two more distantly related gas thermins, E uh, and, and this one here. Uh, and m mice have uh, more gas thermins, um, and they're basically gene duplications. The family arose when a lot of adaptive immunity arose in uh, jawless fish. Um, and um, gastermin D is cut by the inflammatory caspases. It's not clear at all how the other cas uh, gastermins work. They don't, they're not cut by, they don't have the aspartic acid for cleavage uh, by caspases, except for gastermin E, which is cleaved by caspase 3 in, uh, as a secondary event in apoptosis. But mutations in uh, the, these proteins are linked to autoimmune and inflammatory diseases like asthma and uh, alopecia. So this is what the structure, modeled structure of gastermin D looks like um, from uh, Feng Xiao's lab. Uh, two years ago, and nobody has actually been able to solve the structure of gastermin D, so it's modeled based on gastermin A. And it basically has two domains, an N-terminal domain and a C-terminal domain, and they're held together by a very uh, large interface. And the C-terminal domain basically prevents the activation of the N-terminal domain. And they're connected by this very flexible linker uh, in all the gas thermins, and this is where uh, the inflammatory caspase is cut. Um, uh, gas thermin D separating out uh, the N terminal domain from the C terminal domain. Okay, so now uh, to uh, our story. Um, so we wanted to know how does the N-terminal domain of gastermin D cause pyroptosis. And I got into this because uh, my postdoc, Jing Liu, uh, plugged the N-terminus of gastermin D into a homology search, um, and there was no homology to anything at the amino acid level but there was a suggestion of homology of the N-terminal fragment structurally in terms of the alpha helices and uh, beta sheets uh, to perforin, which is the pore forming protein of killer lymphocytes that I've spent a lot of time studying. So if Xing expressed a flag tag gastermin D in cells, nothing happened full length, but if he also co-expressed uh, uh, act, an active uh, wild-type uh, form of, of caspase 11, the cells died, and they died by uh, this inflammatory pyroptotic death. If, if the caspase was mutated in its active site, there was no cell death, and the caspase by itself uh, did nothing. So when he looked at these cells at, at gastermin um, in these cells, uh, either uh, activated by caspase 11 or expressing uh, uh, just the N-terminal domain, he found that just expressing the N-terminal domain killed the cells like here, and the cells on a uh, non-reducing or native gel ran as an oligomer. Here is full-length gastermin as a control. 
And not only did Gesturman uh, form large oligomers, but those oligomers went uh, to cell membranes. This is a non-reducing gel. We have the monomer is about 30 kilodaltons, and the, uh, the oligomer is over 300 uh, kilodaltons. And uh, using their, the, uh, an antibody to the flag tag of the overexpressed protein, you could see that the full-length protein is distributed in the cytosol, whereas the N-terminal fragment went to the membrane. And it, he, we made a mutant based on this homology to perforin, uh, mutating four nearby basic residues in a conserved alpha helix. And that mutant neither caused cell death nor caused the uh, polymer, the multi, multi, the oligomerization or uh, translocation to the membrane. So we know this is a protein that forms oligomers in membranes, and maybe it's working like perforin to form pores in membranes. Next, what we did is look at um, what lipids Gesturman D binds to. So here we're looking at either the N terminus, and different lipids are spotted onto mem immobilized on membranes the full length gestermin or the C terminus. And what you can see is the full length and the C terminus don't bind to lipids, but the cleaved N terminus binds to acidic phospholipids that are on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane or to cardiolipin. Um, the mutated version that didn't go to the membrane didn't bind. And we compared it to two uh, immune pore forming proteins, perforin and granulysin. So perforin permeabilizes uh, our cell membranes uh, from the outside, and it binds to phosphatidyl ethanolamine, which is on both leaflets of the outer membrane. Gastermin only binds to phospholipids that are inside the cell. It doesn't bind to, to, it binds to phosphatidylserine that's on the inside, but it doesn't bind to phosphatidylethanolamine or phosphatidylcholine. Granulysin is actually an antimicrobial, antimicrobial peptide by, in killer cells, and it permeabilizes the membranes of bacteria and other microbes and it also binds to cardiolipin. We're going to come back to that. Oops. So what we did next was we made liposomes um, that contain uh, uh, mixtures of lipids, either phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, or added the special lipids that we found uh, gastermin D N-terminus bound to. And what we found is that the wild type N-terminus, but not the mutant inactive form, uh, was able to uh, bind to lipid, it couldn't bind to lipids with just phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylethanolamine, outer membrane lipids, but it bound to liposomes that had these other lipids that uh, Gastermin D bound to. And not, not only that, but it actually caused those lipids to disintegrate and release a fluorophore that was uh, incorporated within them. So here, um, Gastermin D on its own, or caspase 11 on its own, did not disrupt the liposomes nor, um, but uh, the N-terminus of gastermin D, or the full-length gastermin D plus caspase 11 did. Oops. And then we could actually visualize um, these liposomes, that when we treated them with full-length gastermin D, they were impermeabilized, but with gastermin D and caspase 11, the liposomes appeared to form pores. 
and we could actually see uh, pores if we looked at membranes face down, um, not with full length gas thermin or cast space, but the combination. And they looked to be pretty big pores, about 150 angstroms with the inner diameter. And that would be big enough to release small molecules like IL-1, like the inflammatory cytokines. We also found that when cells were undergoing pyroptosis, for, for example, when we expressed the N-terminal fragment, that the N-terminal fragment was released into the supernatants. We didn't find it in the supernatants of non-dying cells. However, if we took uh, those supernatants that contain uh, the active form of gas thermin D and incubated them with mammalian cells, the cells were untouched. And that made sense because we knew that gas thermin D doesn't bind to any lipids on the outside. Um, and that's shown here when we took cells undergoing pyroptosis that overexpress uh, this N terminus and looked at whether bystander cells uh, that didn't um, were, took up propidium iodide, whether they died. Only the cells that were induced to undergo pyroptosis died. The bystander cells were unharmed. So recently, uh, and all this work is, has been in collaboration with a structural biologist named Hao Wu at our institute, uh, and Jinben Wan was the postdoc in her lab who did this work. And uh, recently, uh, uh, Hao's lab, in collaboration with us, has solved the structure of, of the gastermin pore. This is actually a, a, a feat that they, they this, these are very difficult, all the pore forming proteins are very difficult to work with. Um, they form aggregates, they're very badly behaved, and Jinbin is like a master. He was, ab he was able to um, get structures of uh, gastermin a3, the mouse gastermin A, um, and they're really so beautiful. <laughs> um, and mostly uh, they have a 27-fold, uh, they're made up of 27 monomers. Some of them have 26 and some have 28. And they're able to solve the structure by cryo-EM to 3.8 angstroms. So this is looking uh, from the top down. Um, it would be in the inside of cells. And what you see is that the N-terminus extends these fingers, these beta sheets, to form a large beta barrel uh, in the cell membrane. And the size is similar to what we found uh, in uh, the liposomes, 180 angstroms. And this is the structure. Uh, this is the inside of the cell. This is in the membrane. And actually, you could, we made liposomes with cardiolipin, and you can actually identify the cardiolipin in the structure. And the, the, uh, this is the form of the N terminus as it makes the pore. And here's cardiolipin. So to go from this globular folded domain in the full length auto-inhibited form, this is the N-terminus, to the pore form, the molecule undergoes this radical conformational change. And I like to think of it, it's like a hand sort of digging into the membrane with the fingers uh, are the beta sheets. And this is just a movie of the really dramatic changes that the protein makes when it makes the pore. Uh, if you look at the oligomers and how they interact with each other, 
basically they have a very extended interface uh, with uh, three domains of uh, positively or negatively charged molecules interacting with each other. And when people look, and when we looked at mutations that have been described, they actually fall uh, at sort of key locations in the pore. Um, now this pore looks, uh, looks a lot like the kind of pore that perforin makes. So our initial sort of uh, uh, reason for looking at this uh, wasn't completely off. Uh, but it's, uh, it's actually not, if you look at the structure of the domains comparing um, gastermin with uh, these uh, cholesterol-dependent pore-forming proteins, which are expressed either in bacteria or in mammalian cells. Uh, pneumolysin is one of the ones that has been crystallized, I mean, so whose structure has been solved by uh, cryo-EM you see the structure is completely different. So here we have cases of parallel evolution of uh, biological molecules that have the same function arising independently. So this is um, our view of this innate immune alarm system as of today. There are many sensors of invasive infection and danger. Um, they activate the formation of the inflammasome that activates either caspase 1 or caspase 4 and 5. A key substrate is gastermin D, and it's sort of like a final bottleneck in pyroptosis. It's one molecule that's needed to form inflammatory death as well as release the inflammatory cytokines. And uh, we think that this is a good uh, potential target for drug development. Um, I'm running out of time, so maybe quickly I'll try to tell you uh, how we're looking at um, blocking uh, gastermin and uh, the role of this gastermin in bacterial infection. So we did a high throughput screen. Uh, to identify potential inhibitors of the pore, taking advantage of this liposome leakage assay to screen. We got a number of hits. Uh, in our first screen, we screened about 4,000 compounds. We found 25 that inhibited le liposome leakage, but only three bound directly to gastermin D, and only one of them was active in cells. And that compound, which was called, we call C23, um, was uh, inhibited cell death uh, by both the canonical inflammasome and the non-canonical inflammasome and inhibited the release of inflammatory cytokines. Now, it turns out this compound 23 is actually an approved drug. It's incredibly safe. Um, and so we looked at what, what, it, what effect it might have on induction of septic death in mice injected with LPS um, at doses similar to what is used clinically. And we found that we could um, inhibit death. We didn't completely block it, especially uh, at higher doses of LPS and had a substantial effect on inhibiting LPS. And it turns out that um, that drug actually binds to a particular residue uh, in, uh, in gastermin D, uh, cysteine 191, which in our original paper we showed was necessary for pore formation. So it's accessible in the monomeric form, and it also plays a key role in pore formation at the surface of the membrane. Um, however, it, it, and it reacts with the, it binds to and covalently reacts with the cysteine 191. 
And it turns out that this is a very nonspecific drug. It also binds to uh, the active site cysteine of caspase 1 and caspase 11, inhibits the caspases at nanomolar concentrations. Um, it also, and another uh, compound that we identified in a screen of 80,000 molecules, um, also inhibited the priming of the in inflammasome, namely the activation of, of TLR4, induction of NF-kappa B activation, and IL-1 uh, expression. Um, oops. It inhibited the formation of, of the inflammasome, which we can see with these specs. And this is quantified here. The number of cells with specs in the control samples after, after activating the inflammasome is here. This is with the first compound, C23, and a second compound, A23. And here we're showing that these inhibitors block caspase 1 cleavage, they block gastermin D uh, cleavage, they block IL-1 beta processing and IL-1 beta release. So these inhibitors we've identified are active at multiple steps in inflammation. They're nonspecific, but maybe that's not so bad if they're acting at, on different steps in the pathway. And here, what we, we, we made an antibody to uh, gastermin D that recognizes the pore form. And here, what you can see is that in control cells, you can see gastermin D going to the membrane. But um, in the presence of C23 or, or inactivation of the inflammatory caspases, we're blocking uh, pyroptosis. Oops. So basically what we found too, we've actually found an additional inhibitor that inactivate both canonical and non-canonical inflammasome, activated by many different um, danger signals. Uh, one is an approved drug that at clinically used doses could be protective. They both uh, uh, covalently inactivate the cysteine residue that's important in pore formation, but they are nonspecific. Um, and actually, when I look at the literature about inhibitors people have made to different steps in inflammation, they all, almost all, act by modifying reactive cysteine. So my, I, my thought is that perhaps, um, that reactive cysteines are modified by oxidative state of the cell, the state of antioxidants, and it may be that inflammation as a whole is really reg regulated by oxidative events in the cell. But it's possible that these nonspecific inhibitors may actually target the pathway effectively. I'm not going to go into this, but basically I showed you that uh, gastermin binds uh, to cardiolipin, and it turns out that uh, the gastermin that's released during pyroptosis kills extracellular bacteria. It also kills listeria inside cells. Um, we can knock it down and uh, bacterial loads uh, increase. And what we think is that this dangerous inflammatory response that's activated by these immune alarms maybe actually have some protective effect against the bacterial that activate it. Um, and I just want to end by thanking the people who did the, this work. Um, this is really um, the dream team. Um, our first nature paper they actually did in, in two months. <laughs> uh, 
uh, it was Jing's idea, and he did the bulk of the uh, initial work with a lot of help from Jibin and in my lab and Jinbin in Hao's lab. And Jin, Jinbin is the mastermind behind the, uh, the structure of the poor. And uh, Jun Hu and Jing have, were the people who mostly uh, did the inhibitor work. And thank you. Time for some questions? Okay, I'll start. Uh, so uh, I had uh, two questions here. My first question was that you showed that when you overexpress the wild type, gas dermin D, you don't get apoptosis, but when you overexpress the N terminal uh, yeah. fragment, you get apoptosis. And I think you mentioned that the C-terminal inhibits the N-terminal. That's why right. with the full length you don't get it. So uh, maybe you showed this. If you take a mutant in which the C-terminal cannot inhibit the N-terminal, uh, do you see yeah, apoptosis? Yeah, you, 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 it's pyroptosis, which, pyroptosis. Uh, which uh, apoptosis is non-inflammatory, although th these cell death pathways are actually uh, they're really talking to each other. So in apoptosis, the, uh, you get a late uh, pyroptosis. I, they're, they're not uh, distinct. But anyway, it does. Yes, yeah, so if you, if you just have mutants that block the interface, you, you do get pyroptosis. So just separating out. You know, keeping the cell, the uh, molecules from the molecule from interacting is enough to make the system go. Okay, do you have a question over there, please? Over here, Judy. Judy over here. Hi, Jay. Um, beautiful talk. Uh, the killing of bacteria that you mentioned at the end um, is reminiscent of meganins that form pores and actually have very broad spectrum antimicrobial activity against bacteria, fungi, even viruses. Um, and I wonder whether there's some similarity in the poor formation by the gus dermans. And presumably, um, these, to, to form these pores, you also have to have the cleavage that you described by caspase. So you need that inflammatory step in order to activate the gus derman to then kill mm -hmm microbes, and I wonder whether that's really part of the evolutionary um, development of these molecules. Well, yes. the, you know, pneumolysis and streptolysis and listeria, all these bacteri the bacterial pore-forming proteins that I know that belong to this family with perforin, they don't need any protease to activate them as far as I know. Um, so... Perforin doesn't need any, you know, so uh, uh, granulysin, the, the antimicrobial peptide in killer cells, um, has to be processed. Oh, perforin actually has to be processed because you have to be very careful about, you know, having an active pore forming molecule in your cell. <laughs> <laughs> or in a place where it can do damage. I don't know, as far as I know, the bacterial cytolysins, I don't know when maybe somebody here knows, but I don't know, I don't know that they're proteolytically processed. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the idea is if you could somehow, it might even be safe if you put N-terminal gas thermin into into the extracellular fluid, you could, in principle, kill bacteria there without harming the mammalian cells. But one of the problems is it's so badly behaved as a protein. How, how could you get enough of it to, uh, to do that? Thanks. Alan, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, fascinating talk. Um, I was interested in your con 
conviction that pyroptosis is critical to, to sepsis. Is that, uh, is that clear now? And also, does it, are you, is it clear now that the pores that are formed during pyroptosis are critical for exit of processed uh, IL-1 and IL-18? Okay. Because uh, uh, I think there was some controversy about that earlier on. Yeah, so um, in most cases, um, IL-1 and IL-18 are only released from dying cells, and I think the genetic evidence is good. This is a new field, so I wouldn't want to say definitively that pyroptosis is, is c critical, but I, that's my read of what we know so far. In terms of, so there have been, um, a few examples of macrophages that can, can release um, IL-1 and IL-18 without dying. And um, what I think is going on there, um, so we, we showed uh, a number of years ago for perforin that when the cell membrane, so there's a sort of endogenous uh, defense against membrane damage in all our, our cells called membrane repair. So when the, out, the plasma membrane is damaged, as it is, you know, when muscles move or whatever, um, calcium, which is low inside the cytosol, flows into the cell and it triggers the stereotypic response called uh, membrane repair. And there are a number of events that occur. Uh, lysosomes move up to the cell membrane and patch membrane damage. The damaged membrane is endocytosed and the damaged membrane is exocytosed into blebs. So for perforin, we showed that that membrane repair process is critical for cells to be killed by apoptosis versus necrosis. And I th my suspicion is that these cases where people have described in macrophages the release of IL-1 without cell death, that, and, and that repair response, you know, is a dose-dependent thing. So if you have a lot of membrane damage, it's not enough, you can't repair it. But if you have a little bit, you can repair it. So what I think is going on under some circumstances, there may be limited membrane repair, enough to get these molecules out, but the cells still survive. But, uh, that's just the conjecture. And it's also, you have other mediators like TNF that don't require that pathway that are right, critical for right, sepsis. Right, right, And, you know, some of these molecules, it, it's, I think the cell biology about how the inflammatory cytokines gets out has always been a puzzle because they don't have, you know, leader sequences to show, you know, they don't, they don't get out by conventional pathways. So I think mostly they're getting up through these pores. And I think all the failed clinical trials of blocking uh, inflammatory cytokines for sepsis suggest that something else, we have to do something else. So I was a little confused because you made a pretty clear statement that you think only the non-canonical pathway. I didn't, say, all, 11, I didn't say only. I, I, well, I, Pr pretty much, but it's very clear that NLRP3 through a conventional cat space can cause both cleavage and release of IL-1 data from cells. Oh, that's definitely tr There's no doubt about right. that. So in that case, is gas dermin also cleaved? Yeah, yeah. So cat space one, yes. Gas dermins are necessary for both the canonical and the non-canonical inflammatory pathway. Cat space one cleaves gas dermin D and uh, caspase 4, 5, and 11. So, and NLRP3 is actually activated by the non-canonical uh, pathway, but I think because the membrane damage causes a danger signal that activates NLRP3. But I, no, I, it's not that I, I think the canonical inflammasome pathway is important, I think NLRP3 is critical for many biological effects. I, I didn't mean to overstate it, but I, I think that this new pathway is also important, and in particular, 
for sepsis, it may be the critical pathway based on genetic data. Thank you. No, real quick question. Have you estimated how many gastrumin pores are in cells, how many it would take to lyse it, and how many you would need to block to prevent it? No, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. But it's a good question. So we have a reception in the NIH library. Uh, please come join us. Thank you, Judy.